Jerusalem Post. Now to show you something. Already in the making. The Israeli government now has signed an energy agreement with Egypt. Egypt is going to pipe natural gas from Egypt to Israel. Whoever thought of such a thing? They're going to connect their huge electricity outputs. You know when they say hook their grid system, that means the terminals, so that the two systems is hooked together. So that something happens, there is a breakdown in a certain area, then that area can draw from this line, vice versa the other way. Then Israel has just now released to Egypt an entire mineral and scientific map of the Sinai. They've been five years in making it for the eventual of making a highway from Egypt to Israel. This map shows where all the major mineral deposits are showing they don't want these mineral deposits, you know, covered up, leaving them open then for the mining purposes. But the fact, it is a map that gives Egypt an opportunity on her end to start a highway. So if they're going to send natural gas to Israel from Egypt, and they're hooking up their electric, electrical grid systems, and that, I have to say, brothers and sisters, we are moving close to something the world never realized how accurate this book is. That's the part I enjoy, the accuracy of it. We've got a lot of religious people. They look at this with a lot of questions. Does it mean what it says? And just like Brother Glenn said when he heard that preacher this morning, Wanting to interpret the two prophets there of Revelation as being something of that's almost uh, figuratively. Brother, they're not figuratively. They're literally. All right. <clears throat> now, we are starting a message. As you see here, the title, In His Image, Romans 8, 28, 29. Let's turn there in the Bible this morning to this. And I'm going to take this message slow, but there's a lot in this. I pray that we as children of God and any visitor, I know that a lot of people wonder, well, what kind of a church is this? We're strictly undenominational. I don't believe in denominationalism. I never have and I never will. The first time I was baptized was in the Church of Christ Church. The next church I joined was the Methodist. When God's really saved me then, I began to see things in the Word of God the Methodist church didn't even uphold. This created questions in me, and I felt like sooner or later this would have to bring about an answer. I was privileged to be witnessed to by a brother here in the congregation about a man that had been raised in this area I did not know and I was raised in this area and his name was William Branham I want to say this morning now that the man is done gone to glory there's a lot of big shot evangelists in the religious world they're guilty of watching what certain people are supposed to be teaching as they say they believe the message he brought. I am going to defend the man, but not those people. He is not responsible for what the people are doing any more than John Wesley is responsible for the way the Methodists are going. We've got Methodist clergy today that don't believe in the virgin birth. And if I stood here, brothers and sisters, you can throw rocks at every one of these systems because of the unbelief they project 
towards things in the Word of God. It's just because their system don't cater to it. I have to defend this book, the Bible. Everything in it's true. I don't claim to understand everything that's written. Some of it is history. Some of it is prophecy already fulfilled. Others is prophecy yet to be fulfilled. Others is absolutely admonition and instructions how to live a godly life the way God wants us to live. And we've got all kinds of religious voices in the earth today interpreting certain things from the Bible, hoping to gain their crowd. And out there, there's, <coughs> excuse me, there's ears today in the world that will listen to just about anything you want to propagate. But I cannot help but believe there is a people in this earth who's got an ear and a heart to be honest with God himself, I want to hear truth. And so if you want to find out really what we believe, you won't find out one service, but you just come and watch us for a while, and then you be the judge. Now, let's read our text, written by the Apostle Paul. as he writes this 8th chapter to the Romans. And we know in the 28th verse, and we know, we believers, know that all things work together for good, for the eventual betterment of the outcome to them, the Christian, that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose, for whom he did foreknow, meaning God foreknew you before the world ever had a beginning. He, meaning God, did all, also did predestinate to be conformed, molded, fashioned, patterned to the image. It doesn't mean how tall is his forehead, how wide apart is his eyes. That's not the image that he's talking about. It's the spiritual man. It's the spiritual character, and it's the way the man conducted himself and showed himself among mankind that he, though he looked like a man, he was man, yet he portrayed to humanity his obedience to God because he over and over repeats, saying, the works, they're not mine. They're his that sent me. The words that I speak, they're not mine. They're his that sent me. All of these things prove this was a man that had one intention, doing the perfect will of the Heavenly Father who was all man's creator. Therefore, in that image, in that likeness, we've been called. That he, meaning Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. God, in the process of redemption, is seeking to bring about a rebirth to mankind who is born in sin, shaped in iniquity, and God seeking to reclaim to himself a born-again creation that definitely is formed in the likeness of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Now then, as we start into this message, we realize in the religious world, there are literally thousands of people in every phase of religion of various kinds are aware today and have been aware for a long time. The world is moving rapidly toward a climax. Something soon is about to take place. All of these signs and these indications and world problems and conditions that's going on right now is proof. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, is coming again very soon. Not a century off, but we are a generation that's seeing the Word of God fulfilled in respect to these signs that prophecy unfolds and brings about. Now with that this morning, when Brother Gary Sturt was down here <clears throat> a few weeks back, 
he held up a booklet printed by a man before 1988 ever came about. And the title was, 88 Reasons or Proofs that the rapture and the coming of the Lord will be in October 19 and four, uh, 1988. 1988 came and went, then 89, then 90, 91, then 92. Now we're past October 93, we're heading for 94. And still the prediction and the things, the way he lay it out, and he took it all from Jewish history as well as what he thought the Bible. Now, I'm not pointing the finger to condemn the man because there's multitudes of others, brothers and sisters, that is trying their best to search the Word of God for an answer to the hour we live in. Let me read how that book goes, because little did I realize it had been sent to me a long time ago. It was upstairs in the file. I had never even read the book. But when I was looking in the files for some other material, there it was. Now I want to show you, brothers and sisters, just how mankind can get himself off key by looking at things in the Bible completely wrong when he's already wrong in other areas of the Bible. Now let me say it in this manner. It is not going to do us one earthly bit of good to want to know what does this prophecy mean? Where does that fit in? And how's this going to be? Worrying about those things that we see is imminent right here before the coming of the Lord. If we do not get our life straightened up with other things of the Bible, that shows you and me how I should bring my life in obedience to the will of God. So that the word of God that really unfolds the plan of salvation rather than just creeds, rituals of the church system we belong to. Because most of these doctors of divinity, if they're a Methodist, they're going to be a, they're going to believe that there's three persons in the Godhead. They're going to cater to sprinkling if they baptize at all. There's a few old timers who will believe in mercy, but the modernists, they will hold to sprinkling, and most of the modern Methodist evangelists will emphasize you don't even have to be baptized just as long as you believe. I have to defend the Bible. There's no Bible for that kind of an attitude. That's modern evangelism. When we begin to compromise with the Bible, hoping to influence a category of people who don't want to do this, they don't want to get wet, they think it's just idle time spent, it's a useless step, it's humiliating. Well, if that's the way you look at it, then you just as well look at the rest of the Bible the same way. Because when you read the book of Acts and you see the apostles of old from the day of Pentecost, the birth of the church, as the birth of the church started and the commission was given, go into all the world and preach the, the gospel and so forth. Everywhere they went, there was no such thing as individual choice left up to the person. If they asked the question, then what must I do to be saved? Then it was automatically said, then repent every one of you and be baptized, not in Matthew 28 and 19, as modern Christianity would refer to today, but be baptized, meaning immersed, buried in water, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's exactly what they said in Acts 2.38 and all elder areas in the book of Acts. Early Christians was baptized, got wet immersed in a name that there's only it's the only name on, on, among men under heaven whereby we must be saved and that's Jesus Christ and him crucified Jesus Christ the Savior of the world and when you actually be, really look at Matthew 28 19 which was part of the commission when he said baptizing them into the name 
of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, brothers and sisters, neither word is a name. It's a title of what belongs to something other as a being. God the Creator is the Father. But when God brought forth His begotten Son and then came down and dwelt in Him, then the Son was given the name of a man. And that name was Jesus. Or as the Hebrews would say, Yahshua. And when God, when this man called Jesus was baptized, God the Eternal Spirit, the Father, came down and filled him with the fullness of all of his divine attributes. Now it's God in his Son. God the Father is not a person, but the Son is. So it's God the Father in the person of his Son. And the name Jesus now becomes a compound name. As long as the Son was on earth, he kept telling the people, <clears throat> I have come in my Father's name, speech of the Pharisees, and you receive me not. Then just before he leaves this scene, we, we hear him praying. And he says, I have gave to them thy name. I have made known unto them thy name. And then we see him talking about, it's expedient that I go away. For if I go not away, then the Comforter cannot come. But then when, and I, when he goes away, he will pray that the Father will send another Comforter in his name. Well, if Jesus came in the Father's name, and then Jesus goes to heaven and prays the Father that a Comforter come in the name of the Son, common sense would tell you there's only one name in the whole thing. It's God in creation, that's Father. God in His Son to redeem. But now a name is implied. And when the Spirit of the Lord comes, it's the Holy Ghost. It's, God not, it's not God the Father in another recreative act. It's God in a redemptive act or a redemptive role. And therefore, brothers and sisters, He comes in that <coughs> human redemptive name, Jesus the Christ. And that makes it truly, brothers and sisters, that's why. Acts 2.38 is the fulfillment of Matthew 28.19. And there you have the religious world. Catholics, Lutherans, Methodists, Baptists, and all the rest of them hold on to it. We can say this this morning. That's why God seen fit to send a man that fulfilled prophecy for our day and time to take these things that denominationalism have for decades fussed and squabbled over from the Catholics to the Lutherans to the Methodists to the Baptists to the Unitarian and all the rest of them, terminologies of the Scriptures. And this man stood in this 20th century and went into the Word of God and brought out these truths and he endeavored, brothers and sisters, by the grace of God to put them together and show, you, show to you and me a living Bible in the 20th century that is no longer just a book to fuss about and pick with. It's a book to get back into the right meaning of it. Now then, I want to read to you what this man said and how he comes about his calculation. And that's why I said some time ago, it is wonderful to read the law and the type set for it. When we look in Leviticus chapter 23 and all of those t things, those various feasts, there's seven of them. All of these feasts and these days of observance have certain types. The first four are applicable to Christ and what happened in His first advent. The last three which come about in the fall of the year we will say along the last of September through October into November, they are related to Israel in her end time regathering. But notice, if the first four, which had been observed for over 400 years after the Jews came back from Babylonian captivity, this goes to show until there is a temple again, built on the Temple Mount. There's an altar again on the Temple Mount wherein there is again animal sacrifice offered which constitutes the setting in motion 
as God sees the law and the type for what it was, you can calculate all you want to. You just as well go use a serial book catalog. Because those dates don't mean one thing if you're trying to apply them anywhere in time when there's not a temple and an altar to activate them. It takes that to make it actually a fact. Now, let's see what the man did. <clears throat> he places the rapture of the church on Rosh Hashanah, September the 11th. Because he calculated that in 1988, September the 11th, that's then when that first day would be set in motion. Then, that would carry through to September the 13th. Now, that's not three days, but keep in mind, the first day of it, Rosh Hashanah, keep in mind, it goes in effect at sundown on September the 11th, carries through the night hours of the 12th, then through the daylight hours of the 12th, and then it terminates at the beginning then of the 13th. That's why you see three dates mentioned, but it actually is the 12th, which our day begins in the middle of the night and goes to the middle of the night, but the Jewish day from sunset to sunset. Now the Day of Atonement becomes 10 days later, starting on the 21st of September. Here is when he says, is when the Antichrist signs the covenant with Israel to start the week, the 70th week. Five days later, Feast of Tabernacles, starting September the 26th, the two witnesses, the two prophets, will arrive. He has Jesus crucified now in 30 A.D., This is the starting of the Grace Age and ending in 1988, followed by the 70th week of Daniel ending in 1995. And we're only one year and one month away from New Year's Day 1995. He places the generation mentioned by Jesus as a 40-year period thus beginning in 1948 when Israel was made a state and ending in 1988, 40 years later, then followed by the 70th week of Daniel. He figures that from the very conception of Jesus, December the 23rd, 5 B.C., to December the 23rd, 1995, is the 2,000 years mentioned in Hosea 6.2. He has the Antichrist setting himself up in the temple April the 28th, 1992 to start the last three and a half years. March the 9th, 1992 would be when the two prophets of Revelation 11 would be killed in the middle of the week. He has the Antichrist being a Syrian Jew and has Armageddon start sunset October the 3rd 1994, and the millennium starts December the 23rd, 1995. And most all of that period has done past. And I have to say, the man no doubt meant well, but he missed it a million miles. Not because the word's wrong, but because he hasn't got his mind right. That's why, brothers and sisters, as you watch Trinity broadcast and a lot of these other radio preachers, there are certain things, they'll come right down the line against sin and this and that, but when they begin to look at certain prophetic things that really are put in there for spiritual people, wise people who are concerned about their spiritual life and walk with God. 
Let me say it this time. I care less what the Catholic Church thinks or any other denomination. Well, now you're talking about me, Brother Jack. I'm not talking about you as a person. It's the system that for thousands of years has ruled mankind, held him in the clutches of a trap, and keeps him from going on with God as the individual he should be. That's why, brothers and sisters, Roman Catholicism is portrayed in Revelation 17 as the great harlot, the great whore, international whore, who has given birth to harlots. It's nothing but Protestant denominationalism. And we see Protestant denominationalism today in the earth making their bid for those who will talk like them, be like them, think like them, and sing like them, and they have no more picture of how this Bible looks towards the coming of the Lord than nothing in the world. All because they look at the plan of salvation, they've got it all mixed up, they have protected creeds of men rather than protecting the Word of God. If each one would preach it just like the apostles taught it in the book of Acts, you wouldn't see one Baptist on TV, Methodist, Lutheran, or anything else. They'd either be on there preaching the Word of God, or they wouldn't be preaching at all. Now then, I'm going to lay that aside, because I don't need it no more. There are many other similar things going on in the religious world. They've all got their ideas about how this thing's going to end. And I realize, as I talk, there are people that will say, well, you're talking like you know it all. No, I do not say I know it all. But I tell you, if you want to know what I do know, then please, for goodness sakes, don't hear me watched and then go away with your mind fixed. Hear me out. You never know what a man really believes till you've heard him out. I can listen to any man, even the Pope, and not get scared. If I really want to know what's inside of him, I've got to listen to him. But then when I've listened and I compare it with this, then that's the basis that I determine did he say anything fit to keep. Now then, in his image, what does that mean? Well, I believe I explained it. It's not our physical image, but a spiritual image. And when you look at this religious world today, millions of people have a personal idea. They're religious. They believe in God. They believe that Jesus is a Savior. Yes, many believe he is born of a virgin birth. They believe he was crucified. He rose again. They believe he sent it into heaven. But when it comes to the other things relative to how God purposes to save you and me through the Lord Jesus Christ, they've got various ideas how God purposes to do this. And it's a sad picture that in the end results, the Baptists want to claim they are all the image of Christ. The Methodists, the same thing. The Catholics, the same thing. When in reality, they're not all reflection the image of Jesus Christ. They're literally reflecting the image of how that system wants them to look. You know good and well it is. People's lives are ruled by human influence. And that's why when you do preach truth, people many times become offended at truth because they say, you're talking about my church. Well, how many churches are there supposed to be? I only read about one in the Bible. It was the right church. It started out right. But time and centuries since the early ones that was endeavoring to walk right and act right and look right, when they die off and other generations come to fill the gap and fill the place, the ranks, there is where Satan begins to play his trick. And that's why, brothers and sisters, out of one 
basic image of Christ in his church, his body, Satan saw to then to establish a multiple of ideas and began to inject this into the framework of Christianity. And so we've got today what we've got. And everybody thinks, well, me and my church is going to heaven. That system is not going. And millions that belong to it are not going. Because millions are destined, absolutely, brothers and sisters, to accept the Antichrist. Now then, let me read a little background about the early church. The birth of the church started on the day of Pentecost. That nobody can deny. And it had 12 apostles. Not 12 popes. There was no yet teachers, pastors, evangelists, and prophets. All 12 apostles. I have a reason for saying that in that fashion. As the church grew, God added to the ministry. By 64 AD, Paul writes in Ephesians that God had set in the church the ministry of apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. And if you was to say that in the face of Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian clergymen today, we will agree with you, Brother Jackson, that was what was in the first age, but you see it died off, and there's where it ceased. The word that describes this did not cease. Because he never took it out. If he never took it out of his word, then it means that same ministry still is, from a scriptural standpoint, a part of his true church. It's supposed to be in his true church. And he will not come for a church until it is returned to that same structure and image that was started. By 59 A.D., Paul writes that the nine gifts of the Spirit are also set in the church. 1 Corinthians. These two qualities of the Spirit of God completes the process for God to accomplish His plan and purpose. And that's why you see it all through the book of Acts and you read it in Hebrews, the first chapter. By the beginning of the second century of Christianity, things were setting in. Yes, it was the devil doing it to eventually bring much of this that has come on and accomplished from the beginning up to that hour to eventually bring it to an end. The New Testament was also written by those that are to be special ones, such as apostles, of which Paul is the star to the Gentiles. With that, I want to say, I have some more to read from it a little later on. I had to, brothers and sisters, I'm not one that likes to just preach from notes. But this particular message, I'm dealing with some issues and facts. I must use some notes to keep everything running in continuity with what we're talking about. Having been lived in this area and eventually brought in contact with Brother Branham's life and ministry, I thank God many times that I was privileged to hear him and then to study him. Keep in mind, brothers and sisters, a man can be greatly anointed and used of God, and no matter how great God may have anointed him and used him, yet there's always the human side of him. It's affected by how people look upon him, how people talk about him, how he views the religious situation that he has to contend with. All of these things eventually have an effect and a bearing on him. Sometimes, as 
to what he says, how he makes decisions. We've got to sit in that manner. Now, after 28 years from the death of Brother Bannum, which was taken off the scene in December 1965, I hold here a book. This book was left by one that visited the church while I was gone in Texas. And neither am I going to point the finger at the man. But I have to say, the man put together a picture of something that in the end is going to bring some embarrassment. I have to say it in that fashion. Because had I not sat there as a personal witness to the life and ministry of William Branham, starting in 1952, and I'll never forget some of the first early statements that I began to hear him speak in the various meetings, how God had dealt with him in the earlier years before I had ever met him. He talked how that God, when he sent the angel to him, and as he would pray for the sick, there would be a gift work in his hand. I heard him testify how that gift worked. I had never personally seen it until he prayed for the wife. Then I was privileged to see. Then he tells how that later the Lord promised him, you'll be able to know the secrets of their heart. Then that went on, brothers and sisters. And as I listened to that, then a year in the year of 1955, in the month of December, God gave Brother Branham a vision. And in the vision, he was shown in this how his ministry and calling had progressed up to that point. He was shown as he was out fishing along a body of water. Preachers was coming along and they was more or less commenting how, uh, how do you do that? And in the vision, Brother Branham, he is explaining to these preachers how to catch fish and things. All of a sudden he throws his line out and he begins to bring it in. It winds up all tangled about his feet. I say this to my critics and to the religious critics who want to talk about the man. I saw a man that's a human being. But I saw a man who was a man of God. Now I've got a lot to say, so if you listen to me, maybe together we can learn something from God's book. I'm against this thing of people saying, I believe he was a prophet. He makes no mistakes. God, don't do this. And I'd have to look in your face. You are just a child playing with something and don't know what you're looking at. Because it's all in this book. Here Brother Branham was in his vision trying to untangle the line. The angel then explains to him how this is all brought about because through the past he'd been trying to explain to the people about the supernatural. And the angel says, you're not supposed to do that. You can read it. Brother Branham apologizes to this angelic being. I won't do it no more. Then he is told in this vision as he is made to see a large tent, a little room that he will pray for the sick in. He relates this, December 19 and 55. And I'll never forget, brothers and sisters, Brother Glenn, Brother Creech, any of you old timers. From 19 and 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, into 65. He was always talking about he's waiting for the third pull. 
He is just waiting for the hour that he can get his tent. He speaks in reference to, I believe, three different situations that he says this is a third pull, maybe four. But the point is this, for ten long years, from month December to month December, as he consistently talked about this vision, and yet people through the ten years kept waiting for something that did not seem to materialize. This left some of his followers automatically assuming if he was God's prophet, if that was a true vision, then he's got to raise from the dead and come back and fulfill that. That's the way it may look to some human beings. And I've got to talk like this. I brought my suitcase full of stuff this morning. And I'm not about to step out here and say something I can't back up with what I've got in that suitcase. I'm defending the man. But I'm not defending the people. This man has went through all of his sermons. He's pulled every quote that covers that 10 year period. He builds it in chronological order. Takes it right through to the last statement he ever refers to the third pull. This man calculates it and puts it all together. This man must come back and fulfill that vision and fulfill Revelations 10 through 7. That man doesn't even realize he has made just as big a blunder as the other man that made this blunder. And may I say this this morning? If you think God isn't real, then you find out what truth is, and you'll find out how real He is. And if you think God ain't dealing with some people in this earth today, get your spiritual ears open and your eyes unstopped, and get your heart in shape to be able to recognize what truth is, you and I will learn something. This man emphasizes repeatedly that the prophet of the age says, Now when the time comes, you stick with the tapes. You say just what they say. They don't have to tell me that. I sat there when it was said. I want to say this as I brought that vision to the point where it looked like he was taken over the scene and it wasn't fulfilled. <clears throat> if there was in that third pole a certain realm of certain miracles and works which you as a person feel that was not fulfilled because that's the way you read it, then you could have been one of the many that helped to create the environment that caused God to cut it short. You say, God don't do such things. Stick around and I will prove He does. You ain't going to learn this out of Bible school. You're going to have to learn this by the Holy Ghost and the book itself. If him talking about the first two things and seeking to explain this consistently in an open atmosphere before people and the Lord would see that he's got his line all tangled up as a fisherman. You can't tell me then that for ten long years trying to explain to people telling people that there's something greater yet. I'm waiting on the pull. 
I remember in 1957, the year the wife and I went to Cuba <clears throat> and spent the whole month of December in Cuba, out of Canada came certain families. We saw them at the tabernacle in the month of November. They came down on a visit. Brother Branham introduced them. And he made a statement that morning that he thought some of them was planning on moving from Canada down here. When we went to Cuba then and stayed the whole month of December and we came back then, the 1st of January, 58, they had already made their move. They did not just only move into the area. Them people moved in and pushed themselves right in around his life. And I know if they hear this, they ain't going to like it. But I was here before they were. I haven't seen one yet that pushed himself in around this man's life. But what wasn't bit by something other. And he spiritually is not in a good shape today. It wasn't long. Here they come. You could hear it said. I'm just waiting until he gets that tent. I want to be a truck driver. I want to be a tent man. And while all this type of public talk is going on among crowds of people as they would come from time to time to hear this man, you don't even realize the environment that a few people is building up in a general sense about this man and around this man as they're waiting the hour when somewheres they hope to get a big slice of the cake. We're living in the most carnalist age humanity's ever lived. It's in politics. It's in the economics of our nation. It's in society, the intellectual realm, everywhere. I'm in it for what I could get out of it. Them of the time, brothers and sisters, we do come into the 60s then. Now we've got that spirit being cultivated among certain ones that have moved in close. Do you know who William Marion Branham is? He is the Lord. On and on they began to communicate and talk like this. They were individuals. They wanted to be the right hand man. They wanted to be the drivers of the truck. The ones that set up the tent. And I have to say today to the whole wide world. If God would have let that man have a tent, as no doubt the vision showed, by the time them trucks would have been rolling down the highway, that spirit of deityism would have been in the front car and every other automobile that follows. Because then when he did go to Chicago, then he did wind up in Canada and then had to come home heart broke then I have to say to any Branham worshiper it's your fault that the scene looks like this you did it imagine his heart's desire was go to a city acquire a ballpark or something or other set up this tent Stay from three to four to five, six weeks, as long as God wanted him to. He wouldn't have to depend on any association of preachers. And imagine the people coming. That was his heart's desire, to see the multitudes come that he could preach truth to. But here goes this crowd of converters. Did you know he's this? Did you know he's that? Did you know he's this? 
three campaigns, brothers and sisters, would have hatched out a new bunch and would have set an army in motion. There ain't enough of preachers alive could have preached it out of existence. It's the devil's business because this man had something in his soul ordained of God to give to people to this age of Laodicea and the devil was out to use human beings, intellectual ones, smart, and people that was in a financial state, able and capable to carry out everything they selfishly, greedily wanted to do. That's why, brothers and sisters, when I saw God take the man off of the sea, it made me feel bad. But I heard all these statements. I heard all these quotes. But it did not disturb my faith one bit. I said if God took him off premature, he did it because he wanted to preserve his image. Least the people pervert it and defile it. Like when he did come back and he had to preach the bruised serpent. And he even mentions the various brethren all the way from Georgia, Tennessee and the ones living in this area. Yes, that's all the devil would need. Get a few well-to-do individuals gathered around him, running the roads, following him, telling the masses who he is and who he ain't and what he is and what he ain't. The devil would have had a heyday. But because God took him I'm convinced God took him to preserve his image before the eyes of the few that's going to believe him and stand for it. Now all these others, by their own miscalculations, they have built this other spirit and picture and they're sitting in the road. They've gone no farther than they were in 1965. That's where they sit with their arms crossed, and they're just like the Pharisees of Jesus are. You won't go in, and you forbid those that would go in to get by you. And this is why, brothers and sisters, if I took the rank and the position to do like all these others, to, to get rid of persecution, yes, it would be easy. Just join the crowd. Say what they say. But having been a witness, having saw the man and studied the man, I didn't see him as a man that I could even say, he's God. But I said, God's in that man in a measure. I've never saw one like it. And I'll hold to that even today. Now then, When I say this, <clears throat> inside of this envelope is a composition of critic statements. I'll not mention the man's name, know where he's from. But this man who is the author of this also had an opportunity to sit under the man's ministry long enough that he should have seen something from the Word. But when he reached a certain point in time and he begins to see all the confusion that's created, then he turns to the completely to the other side of the road. He denounces the man and then he goes into all the quotes and statements and begins to compare this one against this one, this one against this one and says, why, if he was a true prophet, you know prophets don't talk like that. Full of it. I sat there for 13 years. I saw it. Now let me read you from the Bible. How we either look at this or how we either miss it. Let me go back here, brothers and sisters, to the Gospel of St. John. It's this, it's this 
scripture where it says he will indeed baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Maybe somebody can get, get it right quick. Matthew, yeah. All right. Yeah. Matthew, Matthew chapter 3, verses... I'm going to read verses 11 and 12. This verse to me is a very important passage of Scripture. Now as I look back through the years of my own life, having been baptized the first time in a Church of Christ church, then years later, changed membership and joined the Methodist Church. See, just to read these two verses, all you saw was something that happened way back there in the eons of time. It's just history. It has relative little meaning for present day. But this is where, brothers and sisters, we have to read the Word of God with real, real careful, watchful eyes. All Judea and Jerusalem has gone out to hear John the Baptist. Third chapter. And they've asked him questions, who he is. Are you the Christ? Are you that prophet? And so on and so forth. Now here's John's testimony in that hour. And may I remind you, was not John the Baptist, was he not the fulfilling of the coming of the Elijah spirit? How many will agree with me? Read the first chapter of Luke when the angel came to tell Zacharias that his wife Elizabeth was to conceive and bear forth a son and they would name him as John and how that he would go before the, the coming of the Lord in the power and spirit of Elijah. So now here he is. He's got that Elijah anointing on him. So they've gone out to ask him and John testifies, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. In other words, he is preparing in the heart of a people out in the desert place. He's actually making a highway through human souls for the coming of the Lord to come on the scene and be accepted into their lives. But he that cometh after me is mightier, more important than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. That right there is pointing to, we will say, the high priest, the mediatorial work that Christ now is in as he went up into heaven on the, the day on the Mount of Olives called the, the, the Ascension. He's in his priestly role. And as he prays the Father, then through the dispensation of grace to us Gentiles, the Holy Ghost is supposed to come in response to that intercessory work. But now notice what else John says. John comes on by saying this, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor. Now, brothers and sisters, the religious world today don't even realize what that passage of Scripture is implying. Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, as he baptizes through the intercessory work, people with the Holy Ghost in fire, all of that is the spiritual sense. But you've got to realize, whose fan is in his hand. Now it's talking about something else. That's to be made manifest at the ending of the age of grace as it's terminating out. It means God is going to purify his harvest of what he's been sowing through the ages of time. That's why, brothers and sisters, you have to take that and liken it unto how the old timers harvested their crops with the sickle, tied it in bundles and stuff, then brought it into a thrashing floor. If we can spiritualize that, how God did in these last days, as this age of grace is getting ready to terminate, and as God then wants to refine the the 
product so that the church will eventually be returned precisely just like it was in the beginning, then it means, brothers and sisters, he is definitely going to cause things to be said. Because if I challenge your thinking by saying, what is a fan? There's no such thing as a fan growing out there. It's not nothing that naturally grows. Do you ever think about it? It's all man-made. That's the point I want to emphasize. There's no such thing. I just sowed a crop of fans. How many knows what I mean? There's no such thing as you grow fans. Or it grows by natural. So a fan is a word that it implies. It is something that man makes to create an artificial wind. A combine has its own fan built in it. But before the combines, then we go back to the biblical pattern. They put the pressure on the crop. They knocked all the grain loose from the stems and everything. Then they took pitchforks and pitched out of the thrashing floor. Now if you can spiritualize that, that's exactly what's going on in our religious world today. God's binding all that tear systems in bundles. That's why evangelism preaches like they do. God don't care where you pile the straw because the end result, he's going to burn it all. But he is definitely after a finished product that looks exactly like he planted on the day of Pentecost. So then when you get all the chaff and stuff out of the floor, laying there on that thrashing floor is all of this grain. But to that is chaff, the husk, the little parts that really form up around the grain head itself. Now you cannot handle that stuff with a pitchfork. The only thing that will handle it is wind. That's why sometimes, brothers and sisters, the Jewish people especially, when the time come then was to, we will say, to glean this stuff and, and clean it, if there was a natural wind blowing, then they usually had a feast and all the neighbors would come in. And the young people, they had great big flat-like trays like. They'd start music, they'd start a singing in a chant or something or another, and they would march around this thrashing floor in a dance singing and rejoicing but they had a certain way of handling this great big tray they were bouncing this grain into the air and as the wind came through they so walked so that the wind would always carry it to the off side of the, of the thrashing floor and they just kept a walking and going and a singing and a dancing until they have cleaned up everything off of the thrashing floor and they have piled all the clean in one spot that's why it says, whose fan is in his hand, and he, the Lord, will thoroughly, means specifically, he gets down and deals in the very detailed manner, purge his floor. I'd have to say, brothers and sisters, people are blind when they can't see the, it looks like such a little thing that is so unimportant, and yet it's so vital. So God sends a man who's got a message burning in his soul and God causes this man to say things plural. One time he will say one thing from one viewpoint and another time he will say it from another viewpoint and another time he will switch back to this and another time maybe switch back to this. I've got it all in there. I'll start bringing it out tonight. I'm just laying a groundwork for it. And that's why, brothers and sisters, then when God takes the man, now he leaves the people and the age of time with a message here, with all of these statements and quotes. What are we going to do with it? Keep in mind, Jesus the person is still in his mediatorial work, isn't he? But he has definitely been invested in a man to get certain things said because somewhere one statement is going to take you right to the book. Praise the Lord. Thank God for that. But another one's going to take you off out here somewhere in the air. Well, now let's see, where do you tie this in? And that's exactly why, brothers and sisters, I've heard them even say, if I had to choose between the two, I will take what the prophet said over the Bible. 
More than one has said that to my face. Now then, and that is exactly what has caused such shame and reproach and confusion that causes these doctors of divinity to write these books which you can get them in libraries today, occultism. And they got a little sketch in there about Brother Branham and the things he taught and they criticize these things, then they imply that his followers are all like that. Here's one that's not like that. The movement don't like it. And I suppose a lot of others don't like it. I can say, not as this man said who wants to go to the other side, that God ordained that man to say things the way he said it. I want to show you. Keep in mind, they will emphasize. But prophets don't talk like that. This one did. When John the Baptist, who had the spirit of Elijah on him, back here in the first advent, made this prophecy in that twelfth verse, whose fan is in his hand, God caused this man who has the spirit of Elijah to say that because it's going to be manifested in the next man who has the same spirit. I don't see it, Brother Jackson. All Old Testament prophets were writing prophets. They didn't write that way. But preaching prophets is a prophet of a do another nature. When John the Baptist, who testifies right here, when people ask him who, is, who he is and such like, he denied being anything like that. He refers to the Christ that was to come. And notice, when he did come, in, there, in the last verses there, he cried out, Behold the Lamb of God. By what means did John cry that out? Did he say this because he knew that Jesus was supposed to be a first cousin? No. The eternal spirit had showed him, On whom you see the spirit descend and remain, that is him. And he cried out, By divine revelation, This is the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. But sometime later, John the Baptist preached a sermon against what King Herod was doing, and all mine. That got him put in jail. It got his head to be severed. Imagine this man who could cry so loud, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. What is that? He's got a vision and a revelation that's motivating him to say that, isn't it? But now after all, John the Baptist is a man, isn't he? So now he's in jail. They've got his number. Day one, day two, day three, day twenty, day thirty. And he's beginning to wonder about himself. How much longer is this thing going to go on? Well, he's still got a few disciples yet hanging around him because sympathetically they felt loyal to him. So here comes some one day to see him in prison. And now look at the human side of John the Baptist. I have to say he's no longer seeing the man that he yelled out so loud. He's seeing himself waiting the hour. And he says to his disciples, go ask that man, is he the one we look for or do we wait for another one? You know what that tells me? Now I see the real John. How many sees the real John in a statement like that? And I can take it right back to the Elijah of old. Because when I read in 1 Kings, all about Elijah and his contest with the gods of Baal. And he tells all the people that's worship Baal, then let's, let's call the gods to the test. He gathers them together up on Mount Carmel. And you know the whole story. When their God, after they have cried all day, cut themselves, they've screamed, and he has taunted them and ma literally made fun of them. Boy, he really irked them. And when nothing happened, then as the sun's going down in the evening time, he rededicates the altar, 
puts a sacrifice in place, and he has them to go out and bring in water, absolutely just to soak that thing, because he wants these people to see the impossible is going to become a possibility. And when he just stood back and he just prayed and said a few words, and a streak of lightning hit that and just consumed water, sacrifice and all, then what did Elijah do? He had 450 prophets' heads cut off. Now, don't nobody come and say, Brother Jackson, you said he had, yes. I know the scripture says, and he cut off 450 heads. One man, brothers and sisters, isn't going to get 450 men to cooperate like that. Now, come on, John, you're next. Pow. How about it, Jim? Pow. You know that. Them men are human beings. And they're afraid to die. Don't tell me they're coming up there one by one. Take it, Elijah. Take it, Elijah. you got to read between the lines to get the story set. I can see him turn to these Jews that now believed that he was serving the true and living God. How about it, boys? Will you help me? I believe Elijah had a lot of help that day. They started rounding them up. Some of them they probably had to tie. Some of them they probably had to set on. But the end result was Elijah was the cause of 450 heads go rolling down the hillside. And then watch old Elijah. Oh, yeah. He ran into town. But when that old Jezebel woman heard what Elijah had done, she just sent out a, a threat. said, you tell that old man about this time tomorrow, I'll have his head. Now this man who was on Mount Carmel, yell a little louder. Maybe he's gone to sleep. Can't you hear him? With a grin on his face. He has God in him. But that's the human side of him, teasing him. Come on. I don't hear you. But when that woman said, about this time tomorrow, I'm going to have your head... He didn't say, I dare you. No, you won't. What did Elijah do? Let's look at the man. How many wants to look at the man? You better look at him. He took a running, didn't he? And they found him in a cave. The Lord found him in a cave down in Mount Horb. The angel of the Lord had to feed him twice on a whole cake. What's he doing? He's running. Who from? That woman. It all goes to show. Now when I say that to the critics that might hear me on tape or something other, I'm not talking about Elijah and running him down. No, I'm just showing you the real man. Well, you have no right to. I do have a right. The Apostle James gives me a right. If the Apostle James could write it like this, knowing that Elijah of old was a man subject to like passions, as we. Passions in that sense mean human weakness, human nature. How man looks at things. When he's faced with conditions and circumstances, how he reacts. And there he is in a cave. You can read it in First Kings. In the latter verses, I mean the latter chapter. And finally the Lord says, Now Elijah, I want you to come out of there. And as he spoke to Elijah, God's prophet for the hour, and you apply to his prophet spirit of the ages. I don't care what, what it is. Elijah come out of the cave, and the Lord said to Elijah right there, Now I want you to return, and I want you to anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. Then I want you to anoint Jehu to be king in Israel. <clears throat> Then I want you to anoint Elisha to be king, I mean to be prophet in your room. Now that's the order the Lord spoke it. Elijah comes walking out of the cave. He's starting back up through the countryside. And he's seen Elisha plowing in the field. And Elijah, oh, things is working well. Now, I'm going to fill in something other here that you people may not realize, where do I get this stuff? 
First off, Elijah lived in a day when there was a king in Syria, Benadad. He was a rascal. Will you agree with me? Elijah knew how honorary and mean he was. And in my heart, if I had been Elijah, I would probably have some fear about getting around that guy. You would too. And yet the Lord said, Go anoint Hazel. And then anoint Jehu. But he anoints Elisha first. And as he anoints Elisha, you know the testimony that was given. And if you read the closing out passages of Scripture, out closing out 1 Kings, going into 2 Kings, you don't read nowhere that Elijah ever even made a decision or even talked about going up to Hazel. How many realize that? Now then, going back and then read between the lines. Because when he told him to anoint them like that, that it might be fulfilled, that he that has escaped Hazel's sword, Jehu has slain. And he that has escaped Jehu's sword, Elisha has slain. Because <laughs> Elisha prepared a great big feast. Didn't he? All right. Now it's <clears throat> it's getting pretty close here to quitting time. But I've said this this morning, brothers and sisters. Every generation of human beings, whether it be Jew or Gentile, when there was a man brought on the scene by God to be used in a dramatic, important way, many of the people of the hour, religious as they might be, did not recognize nor accept God's servant. It's a fact that people, when they're left in their religious frame of thinking, if there's not a hunger inside here that pulls on them to want to know more about God, to know more about truth itself, and how God would want me to live and walk with Him, there is nothing then, brothers and sisters, that really motivate, motivates them to really want to open up and accept something other God is bringing down the road. Because they don't want the traditional part of this religious thing to be disturbed. They just want to be left alone, go on and sleep, go on and ride the merry-go-round, and take it as easy as possible. That's the religious world. So the point is, brothers and sisters, we are living now 28 years past the death of Brother Branham, and you can go to India, you can go to Africa, in practically every major city, you just mentioned the name William Branham, and they've heard about that man that came there, and there was about 300,000 brothers and sisters in that meeting, when that man that had been worshiping the sun and was totally blind, couldn't see, and he stood before Brother Branham, and Brother Branham prayed for him, and God opened that man's eyes. It was known all over India. The point is today, brothers and sisters, God didn't just call him to pray for sick and manifest his gift in that way. That was a drawing card. But the major objective and purpose of God was that in this man's heart and life, there would be a revelation of truth that this man would bring forth. And that's why at the Ohio River there, in the month of June of 1933, I did not hear about it. I was just a little boy at the time. But as my, my wife's cousin testified here later in the years to come and as he was a baptizing I believe the 17th person and how that there was a light came down and a voice spoke out as I was with John the Baptist who was sent to forerun my first coming you will take a message that will go around the world that will prepare the way for my second coming and I have to say brothers and sisters this religious world is literally going to be condemned by God for having rejected this man and they have sold it off, brothers and sisters. And now, yes, even on Trinity broadcast, you can turn it on once in a while and you'll hear some of them older preachers 
They will speak of Brother Branham. They knew Brother Branham. They said in a meeting, they referred to him as a man that started a great move of God in the last days, but they only associated it with that of signs and wonders. But when it comes to the things of his teaching, there's where they draw the line. We don't want it. And so I'm going to bring this part of it to a close this morning, brothers and sisters. It was necessary that God send a man in this Laodicean hour to bring forth something out of his word to point to every type of a denominational Christian, irregardless whether it's Catholic, right on down through the Pentecostal ranks, that there's something in this word they are all failing to accept and see because the end result is God's going to have an end time church that's no longer Catholic, Lutheran, Methodist, Baptist, Assemblies of God, UPC. They're going to be Christians filled with the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of God working in their midst just like it was in the early church. Now the church of Christ can say, that was only for the days of the apostles. Stick around. God's going to have another church just exactly like the first one. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, I'm just a human being. And Lord, I want to say everything the right way to project the right picture, Lord. I just ask, Lord, take these words. May you anoint them and use them in the heart of every human being. Wherever, Lord, you might want to take it. May it be a means, Lord, of helping some precious soul to see the light of what truth is. And to know, Lord, that you truly did something in this day, in this generation, in this age of Laodicea. And Lord, that message is still encircling the earth today. Telling people, get out of these systems. Come back to the Word of God. Lord, that you in the end might put a body of people together, Lord, that is walking in the unity of the Spirit and of the faith. And Lord, that our image, truly, Lord, is the image that reflects Jesus Christ in all of the characteristics and attributes that God you've ordained. I thank you, Lord, for grace and mercy this morning. In that lovely name of Jesus.